fear is that's a natural reaction. <laughs> it's kind of primal uh, emotion because we live in a fear realm. Actually, you know, when you contemplate, you know, and we create a world like a human civilization culture is about creating a, a sense of security uh, for, to feel safe because you know the law of the jungle survival of the fittest is really the the way that the planet is you know it's about big fish eating little ones and survival procreation survival and uh, uh, protecting yourself your young your family and and then there's so, so many unknown factors and my mysteries like the heavens and the sun and moon the stars you know so be you know throughout civil uh, human civilization is always creating you know some kind of way of dealing with the mystery the unknown the vastness the terrifying vastness that we can be aware of, but we're limited to a very vulnerable human form, you know, so when you think about it, it's rather terrifying. And then just think about your own society, how, you know, we have laws and uh, we all agree about, you know, not to, that killing somebody is a criminal offense or stealing lying. There's a, <clears throat> So we, we have agreements on, you know, not, you know, having laws to, to, to that human society agrees to. To uh, otherwise, we couldn't, you know, it'd be even more terrifying. But the ignorant part is is kind of holding to, wanting to keep that false sense of security, because that's where we, you know, we feel safe. And and uh, and and we can relax in that false sense of security. And meditation is waking up, and and so it is a bit terrifying because you're breaking through the illusions that that you that you've been conditioned with. But uh, also in in a, in a Buddhist tradition, you know, the, we take the refuges in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, things like this. <clears throat> for a Buddhist, like in Thailand, where people are, you know, culturally attuned to Buddhism, then, then that is uh, that also gives you a sense of security because you're actually taking refuge in truth and reality and in compassion and goodness, good qualities, awakened attention, uh, and that uh, you know that that's a way in 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 a Buddhist traditional form that you deal with the fear and then uh, then also just uh, be aware of fear you know like fear has a lot of power over you when when it can frighten you and then you run away from it or suppress it it loses its power the moment you just recognize, I know you, you know, you're kind of looking at fear rather than just trying to get rid of it or run away. And so it's, it's, a, it's an illusion that and it's like, a, like a, a ghost, you know. If it, it comes towards you and you run away, it has power over you. The minute you just turn around and look at it, it vanishes into thin air. <clears throat> so, like like mindfulness is uh, is it trust that awareness and and you're you're in a safe place like here at Nana Chat. <clears throat> the uh, at intention here, everybody's trying to be good and refrain from doing bad things, and and uh, the high level of of uh, you know integrity engendered here, nobody's you know out to get you or you know it's not you don't have to you know you you're pretty safe on the 
in in the, in the human way here, because of the commitment to the to the moral precepts and the and the intention of <clears throat> the people living here to not cause harm to anything, to try to be honest and not deceive or lie to anyone, things like this. So that's important to reflect that you're in a safe place just right now, a physical environment. And then when you meditate, then fear comes up. See it as a as opportunity to, you know, if, if it gets overwhelming, just do something else or go to the breath or do change your your attention to something. But but uh, encouraging also to just look at the, the fear feel the feeling of fear, because then you you're you're weakening its power over you when you when you know it. But if you if you just keep running every time it appears, it it has it empower it, it, you're empowering it actually. You're making it more powerful. <laughs> And then, the, you know, then the ultimate in uh, the, the Dhamma is the deathless, Amata Dhamma, or the deathless reality. So people are afraid of death, and death is, uh, and we're all going to die anyway sometime, you know, so the human body. When it, you know, when its time comes, it dies, and and this is a death realm that we're in. Actually, you know, everything around you changes, and and you know, as you, you know, you're, you're getting older, and you're seeing your parents get old, and and you know, your grandparents die, and like for me at my age, everybody's dead. You know, all my parents, my teachers. All the people that were really important in my life, most of them have died, and then uh, so that's. But then we reflect on that. That's just the natural flow of things. What is born dies, <clears throat> and that which is aware is actually the the, the deathless reality. And so, when when you begin to trust it more, then you. You can deal with fear, with death, with loss, with grief, with um, whatever happens to you in your lifetime. You have a way of learning from it and strengthening your practice, even through tragedy or or grief and whatnot. Some of some of us don't really develop much wisdom till we till we have to really rise up and look at something that we're most frightened of or most distressed about. <clears throat> so, you know, modern material life is to make life comfortable, easy, a sense of security and safety built on illusions, having money in the bank and owning your own house and and then you want to get married and have this sense of a secure family, a loving relationship that will last and and all these kind of ideals of that make us feel <clears throat> we're safe and and the future is guaranteed for happiness. But ultimately no the future is uncertain. Yeah. So is it is it is there something that's helpful in the fear? Like is it that you know, as you're kind of opening up and raising your awareness you have to be kept, like, because all of my fear is telling me I need to be cautious because it's like I can't handle it too quickly. Mm-hmm. Is that true or is that just also Well, that's how you feel right now. <laughs> but don't, don't think you have to, you know, just get there all at once. I mean, but... <clears throat> Just uh, you know, if if you find it too unbearable, and do something else. But also, don't believe your mind when it says, "I can't bear it; it's too much." Because that the mind will say that, and 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 uh, but it 
our minds lie to us. I don't know how many times I've gone through that here in Thailand with training in the early years, you know. I've had enough, I can't stand any more of this. You know, the mind would would be inside saying, I'm fed up, can't stand any more, and then I realize I could stand. <laughs> so that, that, that kind of strong feeling, you know, I'm, I can't bear it anymore, this is enough. I began to see as, is, uh, I can't believe it because it's not true, but it, it, you know, it sounds convincing at the time. So you're breaking through a lot of the, the, uh, you know, this belief in what you think. And, uh, because we tend to, to believe in, in these things that, you know, I'm fed, I'm fed up, had enough, or I can't take anymore, as, uh, we tend to easily be intimidated and believe in it. But, you know, just if you just develop a little more patience with it, you'll see it, it doesn't have anything to it. And what you think you can't stand, you begin to see you can. I mean, you find you're much better than you believe you are or think you are. You're much stronger than you might, your mind might perceive yourself as being. You know? That's like, like in the, the challenges I've had in my life where, you know, our life can get very difficult and, uh, and, uh, a, lo and a lot of disappointments, you know, in monastic life, a lot of monks disrobing and people dis being disillusioned and, and uh, being criticized and blamed for things and and you feel, you know, on a personal level you can feel fed up and and hurt and offended and and uh, all that. But then during those times when I'm kind of at the bottom, you know, something in me rises to to t to practice with that. So I, I've gained a lot of strength from 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 being blamed or criticized or or through loss through uh, of what I like and through disappointments rather than they're ruining my life actually <clears throat> through meditation it actually gives me increasingly more strength because I have to rise up to it if you know if I, all I ever get is just you're the great monk and every life is just wonderful uh, you know, then I'm, you know, that's pleasant enough and, and that's, on a personal level, I like that kind of thing, but the strength comes through, you know, the real strength and wisdom comes through, through when life gets difficult, when you don't get what you want, when you lose the one you love, when you, you're, you lose all your money <laughs> and the government takes away your property. <laughs> Those are all... <laughs> <laughs> These are all what we dread, but actually, you know, they can be the very experiences that, that awaken us. Because we have to rise up, we have to be better than we, we feel like being. <laughs> ask a question into this line, that, so how about preparing for those events? Like, um, we come from Bangladesh School here, from, from Chiang Mai, and we have this, we run the school, and uh, now we go to the retreats, and we have all these problems in our head. The things that, you know, come to the school, the things that, that arise from the outside world. What kind school of, is it? Excuse me? What school is it? Banya Den School in Chiang Mai, a Buddhist school. Tancha Yasaro is, is advising us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so we come and the, and the fears, of course, are there all the time. And so we have two, two things. One is look at ourselves and say, okay, this is the fear in me. But on the other hand, we have so many Luk Nong. We have employees, we have families to protect, to take care of, right? So just looking at myself and uh, trying to overcome my personal fears is a very noble thing to do, but on the other hand, there are some responsibilities outside too. So I'm not really sure where the line there is. 
Well, if, you know, if you if you awaken to observe more, then then you're you're caught, you're able to to deal with the worldly problems much better, rather than just being caught in reacting to worldly pressures, which we tend to do, and we can then make you know we can make decisions that that are wrong because we're just reacting. But if you're more patient and observing, then you'll have more insight in what what to decide, what decisions to make. What and it'll come more from an intuitive place rather than a, just a, because your mind, your your conditioned mind, can change from one day. Solution A is the right one, and then overnight suddenly you know B is better, and the next day no, no A. <laughs> You get caught in vacillating and indecision and doubt. And that's where the uh, patient endurance, mindfulness will help you to, you know, you begin to see, you begin to come from a deeper place, uh, the, the, right, the, the just right decision, the what to do, how to do the best for your family, yourself and the school. You know, so where if you look at it just on a personal level, the personality is so conditioned that <clears throat> then we have our own particular karmic attachments and preferences that influence everything we think and do in life, which uh, is that cause, can cause more problems. Or this way, it's much more, it's an intuitive and it's reflective and then wisdom can operate through that, you know, the Panya faculty. Because life is, uh, you know, you, we're in a world that is basically ignorant. You know, you know people don't know what they're doing. And you know any country government that knows actually what it's doing. You know, they all form opinions and vote for one left or right, but nobody knows, nobody knows what's happening, what to deal with the economy or political situation, or how to create the conditions for peace, world peace. And we talk about it, you know, we like world peace and harmony and United Nations all working together, supporting each other in good causes, and we can think, you know, the highest level of uh, idealism. <clears throat> but uh, the world is like this. It's, it is, everything's changing and moving, and we, have, we don't have much control over it. And it's not always moving the way toward the ideal that we have. Things come and go and change. <clears throat> so the best we can do is is learn to, you know, as a human individual, you you can develop wisdom, and that wisdom then is like a universal wisdom. It's not personal wisdom, or it's not knowing about all the wise t sages and learning from others. It's actually opening yourself to universal wisdom. That's what. Yeah, you know, the goal of uh, a meditation is to open to that, to allow wisdom to inform your life rather than just operating from your cultural conditioning and your ego, sense of yourself as a human body, a separate person. And that's what, like the Buddha, this is the brilliance of the teaching of the Buddha, is that it is a, uh, it is a very efficient tool to use if used properly, because it's it's you know the Buddha is taking the first noble truth is suffering, and this is a common experience for all of us, and and so even though you know in the West people will say, well Buddhism is an ancient religion, you know it was appropriate for. India, 2,500 years ago, and they go on like that. And 
But, and, and they can dismiss Buddhism as only something kind of interesting uh, for its past history. But when you look at the actual teaching of the Buddha, it's, uh, it's based on a common human reality that everybody has, whether it's from ancient India or modern Thailand. And that's dukkha, suffering. And so this is uh, <clears throat> taking the most common experience that we can all recognize through, you know, whether you're rich or poor, or male or female, or whatever, you're, whatever social position or ethnic background, we all agree dukkha. <laughs> we all have it. Nobody wants it. We all like to get away from it, get rid of it, and find hap e eternal happiness. You know, what people want is happiness forever and ever. But the Buddha raised this, what we don't want, as a noble truth. And that's, that's very important to see once you change your attitude towards suffering, rather than just blaming it on something else. You're actually looking at it, observing it here. And that's a shift from just being an ordinary person operating out of fear and desire and habit towards looking at something you don't like and don't want. But you're not looking at it in, uh, in terms of how to get rid of it. You're just admitting it. Uh, yes, uh, uh, there is dukkha, there is suffering. And you're, you're, you're not trying to, it's not through any external thing, but it's a sense of what should I do next, or dis-ease. And it doesn't even be because somebody's, you know, putting iron rods in your orifices. It's, it's because you, right now you feel, what should I do about the school in Chiang Mai? And that, you begin to observe that, that doubt, uncertainty, and 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 there is dukkha, and and it should be understood. So the the thing is to is to to observe, admit it, look at it, and then it goes into the second, the causes and the cessation of dukkha. And you are always looking here, rather than trying to organize your school and your your family life so everything makes you feel safe again through an illusion, you're actually, you know, <coughs> learning to rest in reality and dumb in, in the real, rather than in illusions that might be temporarily comforting, but will inevitably disappoint you or fail you. That's why, you know, in modern life, you know, like in England, for example, it's just, the society is, you know, it's developed, it's a democratic government, a good economy. It's, uh, you know, people are still miserable in England. They've got, you know, the standard of living's high, and, and uh, you know, on, on so many levels, it's, it's, it's all right, you know, but still, People are frightened and, and angry and discontented over all kinds, anything really. And then uh, the capitalist system, the free market system, is is determined to make you unhappy with what you have and be discontented. So it, you know, it's uh, it offers offering you something better than you bought the last year's uh, Apple computer, and then they presented a better one this year. And what are they doing? They're trying to make you desire the better one. So, I mean, it's a continuous effort toward, toward trying to make you discontented and unhappy with what you have. And then the political system is, you know, now the, the Tories, uh, and then the labor wants to make everybody unhappy about the Tories so that they have a chance next time. So, you know, the, the whole world is based on this arousing fear, desire, and, and making you discontented. <clears throat> if everybody 
were contented, then the economy would, wouldn't work. The economy is based on making you discontented. So that even though you have everything, it's not enough. You, the, the next year they present a better version, a new fashion, something superior to last year's model. That, how does that affect the mind? You know, it's, it's just to observe that. Because like in, in monastic life, like a bhikkhu life, it's all about, you know, you're being content with what you get. <clears throat> so, you know, you have, you give up your, you don't have money, uh, you, you give up your rights, in other words. You, when you ordain as a bhikkhu, you're giving up your rights. You're not free to just do what you want. You can't just go and say what you feel like saying in the moment. You don't have any money. You have to live a celibate life. So, you know, we all have a right towards sexual life, but we give that up. We give up a uh, right to have money, human rights. We all have a right to have money and, and be free. We give that up. Uh, in order to, uh, you know, limit ourselves and be content with very little, like uh, the food this morning, the bindabat food, the, the robe, the uh, shelter for the night, and the medicine for illness. And uh, so we, you know, we reflect on these four requisites. And, and they're usually, you know, in the scriptures, they're put at the lowest level, like if nobody offers me a, a nice a robe or cloth to make a robe, I'm allowed to go and gather the rags that I find in the rubbish tip in Bungwai village. I can take those rags that nobody wants and make myself a robe. <laughs> That's pretty low standard, you know. <clears throat> but Bungwai villagers would never allow me to do that. <laughs> So they always give you very nice cloth, but they, uh, but the attitude is to be content rather than, than always thinking uh, he has a better robe than I have, <laughs> and then want to, to get the latest, uh, a better robe than the one you have. Then, but I mean, if we, we do have those feelings, you know, because we carry that from lay life into monastic life, but. The aim is to observe the suffering involved in envy and wanting something that you think is better than what you have. And so you're moving towards this level of contentment, which is very rare in the world. And William Blake, the poet, said, you know, he, he made the comment, contentment is heaven itself. I will totally agree to this. The only thing that comes into play for us is responsibility for others. So if we are content for ourselves, we're, um, yeah, sometimes it, you know, we can, we can retreat into that contentment and then we have 200 employees and uh, nothing happens and they lose their job, so. Well, contentment doesn't mean just passive. It gives you stability and then you can then you have to do the best you can with the situation you're in on a, you know, on a worldly level or a social level. It doesn't make us stupid. It <clears throat> but it gives us stability and uh, a, a sense of, you know, a, a stable foundation to, to deal with the problems of life that whether we're monks or lay people or whatever. I, can, uh, I have a question. <clears throat> As a householder, I went to go on a meditation retreat for a year. When I come back, I'm usually full of motivation and I sit morning and evening. Um, I have a family, I have kids, I have a job, and then I find that during the course of the year, the amount of time that I make, I discipline myself to sit reduces 
and the motivation decreases, although there is still motivation there. So my question is, how do I maximize, as a, as a householder with a busy life and, and a family, how do I maximize my uh, ability and my opportunity to, um, to reach more peaceful uh, and kind of contentment you were talking about? Well, it, it's like the worldly life is is not peaceful. So, and and the sense realm is not a peaceful realm. It's about change and birth and death and old age sickness. And it's about loss and despair and success and and that. So, so the condition realm is all about change. And then, then we long for peace. But you really, you know, and then you go on a retreat and you, because you're restricting the input on your senses, you're not, you're not seeking exciting experiences and you're, you know, you're shutting down more. And then through sensory deprivation and lack of stimulation, then you go into a very peaceful state but then when when you look, when you get out of that then you're back into the exciting changing crazy world of modern life and uh so it's it's like but the true nature your true nature is peaceful and it's always peaceful but we don't notice that because we're we, you know, we're trying to find peace as an ideal by maybe limiting the amount of uh, exciting impingement. But that kind of attitude will only, you get a kind of momentary peacefulness from it. But it's not the real peace, it's not natural peace. And so, like in your, when you, um, Meditate more on, like, space and consciousness, things that, you know, rather than just trying to, to get calm and tranquil and peaceful, just what is, like, space itself is peaceful. It's like it's here and now, it's, uh, it's everywhere, and yet we, we ignore it for, you know, the, and we look at the things in the space, and consciousness also, we're all conscious and it has no boundary. Consciousness is not limited, but, but we always create limitations by grasping conditions that are limited. Like, so you're, you're constantly holding to conditions whose nature is to change and you can't stop it. And, and, uh, and they don't, you know, they get better and better, then they get worse, and then they go up, and then they go down. Um, so, being aware of that. Understand the world and, 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 and the state, you know, and the opportunity we have to, to learn from it, then we can, you know, we, we're not creating conditions that, that of suffering for ourselves or for others. And then, uh, you know, the, uh, living in Thailand, you know, I d decide, I'm just going to accept Thailand for what it is. Totally accept, in, in the UK, I went, lived there for 34 years, I just, <clears throat> because I went with two other Americans, and Americans are always c complaining about, you know, how much better it is in the States. So I... So I decided I wasn't going to do that. I was just going to accept Britain as it is, and the way the people are, the society, good, bad, it's, it's good side, it's bad side. <clears throat> and that way, I enjoyed living there, because I wasn't there to criticize it or compare it, or to just ignore, you know, the things that aren't very good there. It wasn't I was stupid and I just didn't notice, but. I wasn't 
I was I was operating from a different place than just a personal conditioned view of how Britain should be. Same with Thailand or the United States or wherever you're from. But it's a it's a way of of changing from just being caught in our own cultural way of ex- interpreting experience and personal preference to you know begin more aware more of of the of the totality of it rather than just being upset and critical of the details that don't particularly please us um, when I meditate and practice and I found my anger arise so easily and when I know it that it's already arise it's very strong and it's very I, I, I know it I'm aware of it but it will stay for some time hours without react and then later is gone, it's like completely gone. But at that time when the anger is there and you're aware and you try to let it go, after that it's very tiring. So I don't know how to deal with it because I think my anger was um, get more often or I aware it more because when it comes even a little bit so I I recognize it's very fast but it's it's tiring sometimes and I just lost my energy because I look at it and <laughs> so Well with that just sometimes you feel you've gotta look at it and do something with it. Uh but uh, letting go of it just means don't make a problem about it. And then, like in meditation, you like this happens a lot. Like when when I first started meditating, when I was a samanera, and I I lived in in, in a monastery in Nongkai for a year, and they and the first three months. It was like this Kao Hong practice. You go into Kuti and and you just stay there. And uh, I didn't talk to anybody or anything, so I was with myself all the time. And and I was trying to, I was hoping to be tranquilized, you know, to live in a state of bliss. And uh, But instead the first three months was just anger. Un- un- relenting anger. And it wasn't due to anything in the monastery. I mean, they were treating me very well. It was, it was just, you know, I was 31 and I'd repressed anger in my, you know, from early childhood. You were punished for being angry. My parents were, you know, said it's wrong and you shouldn't be angry and things like that. So I, I'd learn how to repress it. And then in that particular situation uh, where you, you don't have anything to do and you, you just, you bring in, you brought a meal in the morning and then you don't have any friends to talk, you don't have a telephone or television or anything, you're just by yourself all the time. And you know, no, have no way to escape and the repressive techniques don't work anymore. You just have to sit there and let it happen. So actually, that's what I did. I just, I gave up trying to stop it or change it or but just allowed it to arise. Because it's like something repressed and then it, it starts coming, reaching consciousness. So see that as liberating, you're actually, rather than meditating badly, you're actually purifying it, 
like, like repressed resentments, fears, angers arise. And it's like a cleansing. You're letting them go, so they go away from you. If you try to stop them, then you're, you're repressing them again. So then, you know, it's like the prisoners want to get out of the prison. They're yelling, and, and then you open the door, and they come out. But what you see is just frightening and terrible, so you slam the door on them. Then they, they're locked back in to create more problems. But if you open the prison gate, let the prisoners out, they go away. <laughs> they don't come back. <laughs> so look at it more like that. As long as she does it when I'm not next to her.